you're eager to hear him. <laughs> Dr. John Trever was on campus about a year ago and uh, spoke in the sunroom in the afternoon in our church in the evening. And uh, we had uh, a good response in both meetings, and particularly in the evening. And I want to announce here again that uh, he will be speaking tonight at 7.30 at uh, Collegiate United Methodist Church on the subject of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Qumran community and showing some colored slides so that if any of you have opportunity to go there or tell others about that yet, we'd be glad for you to do that. He's speaking this afternoon on a subject uh, which I think would be of considerable interest to people in biblical studies and who are uh, quite concerned about how the Bible is being used, and, and it's being used a lot in these days by different groups around campuses. Um, unhappily, I expect many of those who are using it and, and misusing it aren't the ones who would come to this kind of a lecture, but his subject uh, is quite a timely one, I think, there been books written about the biblical record leading up to some climactic events uh, of the world even. And uh, we have a scholar present with us today who can uh, interpret to us the scriptures, we think, from a uh, more scholarly basis. And so it gives me pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. John Trever. And his subject is uh, 1984 apocalyptic end or a new beginning. Trevor. Thank you very kindly. It's awfully good to be back again in this institution, which has a great reputation across the country. <clears throat> and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share something of a deep concern that is hitting campuses all across the country. <clears throat> and it's my hope that um, you can become emissaries for communicating uh, to the students, uh, <clears throat> many of whom apparently are not present. <laughs> but we, we need to get to them because there's some amazing things going on on campuses. Today, we're having the experience at Baldwin Wallace College, which is a small church-related college. Well, maybe not so small either. In proportion to this college, of course, it's very small. <clears throat> we're having experiences which uh, make it extremely important to enter into dialogue. There is a vast wave across our country of uh, concern about apocalypticism, about the coming end of the age. As a, a one who is deeply involved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I find myself very much enthralled with this subject in view of the fact that it is so central um, to the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. The men of Qumran were persons who lived in daily expectation of the end of uh, Kairos, that is, of cosmic time. They lived in daily expectation of a great cataclysmic change in history. They expected a 40-year war to come in which they were going to be directly involved. But they were pacifists, strange as it may seem. We have no evidence of their having prepared for war. We have no evidence from the documents um, that they, <clears throat> or from the archaeological remains, that they made instruments of war. <clears throat> we do have evidence of uh, some <clears throat> military remains from the attack on the community by the Romans in AD 68. But these people believed, and a very interesting facet of their faith was that when the time came, it was God's own time, when that time came, when God wished to bring about the end of human history and the beginning of the age of God's planning and God's will, that he would send the necessary heavenly hosts to 
usher in a 40-year war. The war is vividly described in the document which is known popularly as the battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, a document which I think was written probably in the early part of the first century A.D., a document that describes vividly the very every step of the war that was going to be fought. But these people who lived there believed that God would provide all the instruments necessary for the carrying out of that particular activity. And so they lived in daily expectation of the coming end of human history as we know it. And that point of view, of course, is basic to biblical history of the latter part of the Old Testament, and it emerges strongly in certain aspects of the New Testament. And thus today, people who are feeling the impact of uh, frustrations of conflicts around the world, and in every period, the last, especially the last two centuries, this period of, <coughs> of crisis, you always have a large number of sincere people who go to their Bibles and begin to look for evidences of the coming end of the age and begin to count methods of interpreting scripture to fit into the things that happen in history. And this is happening today in a larger way than it has for many years, in fact. It is polarizing our churches. It is polarizing our colleges. We have students on the college campuses today who are very actively engaged in trying to persuade the student body or students quietly, they, they work at it individually, uh, that their uh, coming end of the age is about upon us. Now, there, the last two years on our college campus and in others in our area have seen a great increase of this kind of activity. In fact, I often have said in the last few years particularly that I feel like a lion in a den of Daniels among my students. <laughs> it is an amazing attitude that we get. Well, I won't describe those details because some of them are, uh, in a sense, they're, they're humorous and yet I feel somewhat tragic in view of the fact that when students who are capable of coming to college become involved in that kind of thing, it seems to me that a crisis has been reached of the mental attitudes of students Then we need to do something to offset it. And I believe that the error that we have had in the past has been that we have tended, those of us who understand these things and those of us who have a different point of view, our error has been in ignoring it. And therefore, I've been doing quite a bit recently in trying to open the issue in every way possible, try to find techniques for getting to the minds of people, both for those who have a broad-minded point of view, who could use it and use them effectively for helping in this situation, <clears throat> and also for trying to get to the minds of persons who are so effective. Now, because this problem is not going to go away. I deliberately mentioned the, the date 1984 because that has been the popular date of focus. It's been the target date of many of the groups. However, there are other dates that also are uh, used. And uh, as I'm sure some of you are well aware, that there have been many such dates that have been used. I'm not sure you're aware of the one that happened in 1970, uh, for instance, uh, when uh, there was a group down in North and South Carolina known as the True Light Church of Christ with the headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, who had approximately 450 followers. These people were absolutely convinced that the date, the proper date for the focus of the coming end of the age was 1970. See, that was five years ago. And so come 1970, and nothing happened as they expected it. Naturally, it became an interest to the newspapers of South Carolina and North Carolina and the newspaper reporters. In fact, in our own uh, Cleveland paper on January 4th, 1971, I clipped out this article in which it spoke about 
the interview with the leaders of the, this branch of the church to find out what had happened, what went wrong, because they were convinced that the world would end in 1970. And they said yesterday, which was January 3rd, 1971, um, that they were surprised and shocked by the failure of the prophecy, but not to the extent of doubting any of the sect's other doctrines. And the man who was the leader, Elder H. Black Braswell, who was the temporal head of the church, said he could give no satisfactory explanation. He did not know whether he would reopen the upholstery shop that he had closed a year ago in pep preparation for the end. He said that 17 others who had quit their jobs were undecided whether or when to go back to work. One man who had worked for the post office for 23 years said his job had long since been filled. <laughs> so he was in a bad way. Uh, Braswell laid the failure of the prophecy to a misinterpretation of the book of Revelation in, in 1870 by the sect's founder, Cunningham Boyle. No members have left the church and they continue to have faith in the sect, so says the leader. Well, this is one of many such stories that can be gleaned from um, the last century in this country. But I am finding that the attitude is becoming more general as a result of the approach of 1984, which is one of the key dates that was proclaimed in early in this century uh, by the early group known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now I understand they've changed to 1979, and uh, others have other dates right around 1984, though 1984 I think is the best known date. I remember some years ago I was at a, a World Congress of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Christians, uh, in their headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was giving a lecture in, in their World Congress, and afterwards I listened with great interest to a speaker who had come from some foreign country from the mission field who was a specialist in the problem of the, when the world was coming to an end. And uh, I listened with great care to his process of reasoning that led to the date 1984, and he was using the date 1984. I wanted to see if I could get the details of how they used, how they calculated this date. Well, I went over it again here recently to trace it down in view of the fact that uh, the date was beginning to appear in a number of places, though you'll also find that many books and, um, and prophecies of this kind don't date things. For instance, perhaps you've read the little book which has sold over a million and a half copies called The Late Great Planet Earth. If you haven't seen it, and haven't read it, well, please don't. It's, um, <clears throat> I would recommend, don't recommend it. I just, I'm not trying to advertise at all because I think it's a most unfortunate book to have been published. But now this one doesn't attempt to give you an exact date. However, back in the background of this author's thinking is the period between now and the end of this century. That seems quite clear. <clears throat> but one of the things that I noticed recently, and I made another analysis of it, that when 1984 comes and goes, and the expected events have not occurred, they're going to do as they have in the past. They're going to go back to the Bible and begin to see where they made their mistakes. And I know where, what they're going to do, because I know where they've made their mistake. They've made a very important, basic miscalculation from their failure to understand archaeological materials properly. So that when 1984 is passed, <clears throat> they're going to discover their error and they're going to begin to talk about 2004. And that's going to be the date that probably you'll be hearing after 1984 as the date for the end of the world. Because they'll discover this error and they just, it'll be, they'll discover that they're 20 years off from their method of calculation. <clears throat> and then you'll be hearing the date of 2004. Now, I'm not going to tell them what their mistake is. They've got to find that for themselves. In fact, a few months ago, I was talking with one of these persons who was quite convinced that the world's coming to an end, uh, not too far hence, and they actually used the date 2004. I didn't say a thing, but I wondered whether maybe someone has already found the error and is already beginning, therefore, to push the date farther along. Well, when 2004 comes, there's also going to be a radical change, I'm sure, when that, when that time comes. Now, the product, <clears throat> the problem that we face is that it is a product of a modern trend that began in the 19th century. And I'd like to just state 
a few basic principles that we need to observe if we're going to be able to handle this. And I would hope that, that those who have a liberal trend in their use of the Bible and are trained in the proper and sound use of the Bible, I hope that, that we might learn about these things so that we could use them in, in carefully and trying to help ease the minds of those who are caught in the grips between the two forces, as so many people are. I remember a lady came to me as, um, after a lecture here a few months ago, and, and she just expressed almost emotionally how much she appreciated what I had said. She says, you don't know what this means to me. I've had a great burden lift, lifted from my heart tonight. And uh, I was delighted to, uh, to know that she had so found the answer to her problem from an analysis of some of these things. Well, this is what I think we need to do because we do not realize how many, <clears throat> excuse me, and you might say simple-minded people, people who are not so well trained or not so well educated are caught in the grips of these propagandists who play upon the minds of simple people and these uh, simplistic biblicists, as I like to call them, uh, who have created many tensions in many people's hearts. I know one lady, and I worked with her for a while, but I found the problem was beyond me. I referred her to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist has referred her uh, back to, to me because uh, it's a, uh, he says it's a biblical problem. It's really not a mental problem, but unfortunately the two are bound up together. And I finally discovered that perhaps through a lay person who is well informed of biblical uh, matters could help this woman, but it's been a hard struggle. She can't seem to get rid of her fears. Well, therefore, we, we can do a service if we can get the facts and to work with them carefully and uh, in, a, in a concerned way. But the problem really began at the end of the 19th century, it seems to me, with the development of what was known as the series of Niagara Bible Conferences. These Niagara Bible conferences developed largely as a result of a reaction to the scientific movement of the, particularly the latter part of the 19th century, Darwin and Darwinianism and so forth. It was a religious reaction to the scientific development of that part of the century. But in 1895 is when it came to a head. It was in that Niagara Bible conference of 1895 that the five fundamentals of Christianity were established by this group. These five basic fundamentals, which they said, were the, ab the absolute foundation of the Christian faith. <clears throat> now, these fundamentals are, are usually stated in such a way that I count six. So I don't know exactly how to escape it, but I'll just mention them because they always come out with six in my way of calculation. But what they do, they put two together in, uh, in different ways. And therefore, I haven't decided which is the correct way to do it as <clears throat> I found it published among them in different ways. But anyway, the first one is the, is the one I'm most concerned about, and that is the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture. Or another way they state it is the inerrancy of Scripture. The second one <clears throat> is sometimes stated as, um, as two parts. It is the, uh, the virgin birth and the deity of Christ. Sometimes that is stated as two separate points, and that's the reason why I get confusion about the numbering. The third one is the blood atonement. The fourth one is the, <clears throat> is the physical resurrection, and the fifth one is the assured parousia, or the return of Christ. And so sometimes the resurrection and the return are made as one, and sometimes the deity of Christ and the virgin birth are made as one. So that's why it seems to me there are really six. Well, anyway, these were established in 19, 1895, and then in 1903, a book was published very much like this little book here, The Late Great Planet Earth, although it was called Jesus is Coming. And it, they published three million copies of it as a result of a wealthy group of men in Cal Southern California who distributed all over the world, two million copies in this country and one million around the world. And the parallel to this particular book is so insignificant that I, I feel that I should make mention of it because this has created the same problem that that created. <clears throat> then they went further. And, uh, during the early uh, part of this century, and uh, between the 1903 and 1909, there were 12 small volumes were put out elaborating these basic fundamentals. In fact, the series was called The Fundamentals. 
And thus we, of course, are all familiar with the fundamentalism, the term that has come out of this. <clears throat> they established a school in Los Angeles, known as the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. They also established the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And I'm sure you're familiar with those institutions. Then in 1919, they held the World Christian Fundamentals Association meeting. And this is the point when it was formalized into a structure that really was sort of a declaration of war against religious liberalism. And of course, many of you may recall that <clears throat> the famous minister of the um, church in Riverside Church in New York was the prime attack of, um, by this organization, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick. <clears throat> so Fosdick became uh, embroiled in this controversy. And this whole controversy has waxed and waned through the decades since, until now it is coming to a head once again, all across the country. And interestingly enough, instead of approaching it through high schools, junior high schools, high schools, and religious groups and so forth, <clears throat> now it is a campus effect. I mean, they're, we're working on the campuses all across the country <clears throat> in various ways. We've had it hit through two different campus organizations in our campus. This last summer, a, a meeting was held in Lausanne, Switzerland. Perhaps you heard about this when 3,000 evangelicals gathered. Now, the purpose of the meeting <clears throat> was to uh, try to resolve something of the problem. It was a very high-level purpose. You know, the Billy Graham Foundation was very much, and Billy Graham himself was involved in this. <clears throat> there were many uh, persons concerned about this, uh, from liberal churches and conservative churches, trying to get together to see if there's a way <clears throat> to resolve the problem. The Lausanne <clears throat> Congress prepared what is known as the Lausanne Covenant. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but I <clears throat> recommend it to your careful reading because it helps to see the basis of the problem. <clears throat> and this. Uh, this Lausanne Covenant was a six-page, single-space document with 15 basic points, and, and taking the five and expanding them now to 15. The purpose, of course, was a very good purpose, and that is to unite the spiritual life of, the, um, of Christians into a greater unity. But the question is, will that be what will happen? In November, a group of Methodists met in Jerusalem, 50, or 20, about 2,300, I believe, met in Jerusalem for a similar objective to take a look at the whole matter of the problem of the disunity in the churches and the, the dangers to the churches by some of the fanatical groups that were disturbing and polarizing our churches. They issued a document uh, from Jerusalem that I like. I've preached several sermons on this because I think this is one of the greatest things that has come out. I'm proud to be a Methodist because of this. I think it's the finest document that's come out since the time of John Wesley. Uh, it's called, uh, one side of this document, it's just two pages. Uh, one side's called A Message from World Methodists Gathered in Jerusalem, A Message to the World. How many have heard about this? Have any of you heard about this? Oh, well, good. I'm glad some have heard about it. Anyway, um, I, I think it's a tremendously significant statement. On the other side, it's called A Pastoral Letter from the World Methodist Consultation on Evangelism to the member churches. Now, many are criticizing this severely because they say it's not biblical. Well, I find it just bristles with biblical uh, foundations, but sound biblical foundations. So I'm very happy about this document. If any of you would like to see it, I have several copies here. You might like to take one. Um, anyway, this was an attempt on the part of the United Methodist Church to take a serious look at this uh, problem from a uh, depth perspective. And out of it came this splendid statement that I think could be of tremendous uh, value. But back of all of this, as I've worked for 40 years in the field of biblical research and study and teaching for 34 years in, of biblical subjects, I have found that always the most important point, the, and the basic issue, the one that we must work on the most if we're ever going to solve this polarization, is what is the first fundamental of the, um, the five fundamentals. That is the crux of the problem and always the nemesis of any dialogue. And therefore, this is the place where we should begin. And that is this basic statement of plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture or inerrancy of Scripture, or however you wish to state it. It's stated many ways. There's been an interesting development since 1950 when I became very much embroiled in this whole matter. 
for I was the representative of the Committee on the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And some of you may recall the reaction to the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And the reaction expressed itself by filtering through my office in Chicago, and it was an amazing experience. I could hardly believe it. But <clears throat> by persistent efforts, we have at least been able to come to grips with one aspect of the problem with these people so that they are no longer putting the stress on the King James Version of the Bible as the inerrant scripture. But now they are recognizing they've pulled back to a, de a new position of defense. They've pulled back to the fact that it is the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts of the Bible that were the plenary, verbally inspired texts. Now, we don't have such texts, and therefore it's always a safe position uh, to which to retreat. <clears throat> so at least we've made that much progress. The King James Version of the Bible is not the one now that is being the one of absolute defense of this procedure. Therefore, during the period of about 1950 to 1970, and there's been a tremendous development that I think is most encouraging in this whole area. These very conservative people who have followed this, these trends, it's a great development of what we call lower, lower criticism. Some of the finest work on lower criticism is being done in those circles. Many of these very conservative minds have gone ahead and worked on the whole matter of how do you get back to the original text of the Bible. They're excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're excited about the Nag Hammadi Coptic manuscripts. They're excited about all manuscript studies. And they're doing some splendid work. And therefore, it's been a great contribution to biblical scholarship. They've grasped the significance of getting back to the original text of the Bible. So that is a, a positive value that has come out of this, this conflict. So lower criticism, therefore, is now being developed and used and uh, by uh, many of these um, very conservative people who use the Bible in this way of plenary verbal inspiration. But now, when it comes to the matter of the, the future of our world, <clears throat> the approach to the problem of apocalypticism, we must use many different channels because <clears throat> there really is no hope of convincing these people unless you can help them to see the folly of the basic assumption which <clears throat> is the plenary verbal inspiration of the original text or whatever text they wish to state as being the original text. We need to use careful techniques to help people confront the reality of the problem. Just last night in my lecture at the Wartburg Theological Seminary, we spent, worked until almost 10.30 that uh, last night with a, a young couple who were struggling with this problem. I felt that the essential thing is to get back to the basics, back to the basic assumption that you make with regard to your approach to the Bible. How does God work in history is the question I kept throwing at these, at these young people last night. Help them to come to grips with the nature of Scripture, the nature of the human element within Scripture. How do you sort out what is human and what is divine? And come to grips with these things. Now, there are various ways in which this can be done. I just want to throw out a few suggestions. You might like to jot them down, study them, and maybe use uh, some aspects from them. For instance, um, uh, the, one of the important things is to, is to sneak up on them using things that they're not accustomed to having faced before. For instance, if you take the 37th chapter of Genesis, ask them to read the 37th chapter of Genesis very carefully, and then ask themselves the question, and this can be done in any, any Bible except the New Living Bible. The New Living Bible has done us dirt at this point because they have, they apparently, the, the one who prepared that was aware of the problem and he's done a beautiful job of cover up. He's just covered it up completely and you can't tell that it's there. <clears throat> but any other Bible, you'll find the problem, that there is a problem there. And ask yourself the question, what is this problem and how do you solve the problem after you've, dis after you've defined the problem? Well, I'm not going to take time to go into it because that would take a whole hour of discussion to see the technique used there. But this is a good place to begin providing you master it yourself, and you'll find it's a very stimulating procedure that you can follow. 
I would say avoid Genesis 1 and 2 because Genesis 1 and 2 is what, what everyone expects you to do, and so they're always ready with, it's like a red flag waved before a bull. But um, find some other passages. Take, for instance, 2 Samuel 24, 1, the story about David taking the census, and then compare it with 1 Chronicles 21, 1. 1 Chronicles 21, 1. And there you will find a very interesting springboard. That's the one I used last night. And um, we had a very interesting discussion. One that I have found very helpful recently in talking to these people about these things is to use Acts 7, 1 to 4. And usually it's a good idea to read the sixth chapter. It's a story about Stephen and the stoning of Stephen and Stephen's speech, all that whole section. Get it familiar in mind. And then notice particularly the verses uh, in Acts 7, 1 to 4, and then go back and ask yourself the question, what is Stephen talking about in his speech? He's talking about the story of Abraham. Go back to Genesis chapters 11 and 12 and see how Stephen uses Genesis 11 and 12. And if you don't discover the problem and get a good springboard for an honest, objective approach to the study of the Bible, then I don't think you're reading carefully. Anyway, this one you'll find a very stimulating process. Again, um, I'll work with anachronisms, although again, these are becoming more familiar now and are being carefully um, treated and uh, the biblicists are being, their minds are being carefully covered up uh, to, to avoid these. But take uh, Genesis 26, 1. Here you need to know a little Hebrew, unfortunately, to, to see the full effect of it, but the basic part of it, if you know history, it's perfectly clear that where it speaks about um, Isaac going down to Gerar among, uh, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now that's impossible, that, that's historically impossible. In the first place, Abimelech could not be king of the Philistines because Abimelech is a Canaanite name and no Philistine would ever have a Canaanite name, especially a king. So that there's obviously a problem there. But then the other problem is, of course, that there were no Philistines in the time of, of Isaac. The Philistines don't appear until seven or 800 years after the time of Isaac. So you have an anachronism. And, uh, and this is a good way. Get into the historical background. You pick up hundreds of anachronisms, which are perfectly meaningless as far as the biblical message is concerned. There's no problem about the biblical message. But when it comes to strict historical matters and inerrancy of scripture, they do create problems. And so I urge you to think um, and to work with some of these techniques. But I won't, that isn't the purpose I have today. It's simply as to urge that we try to find ways gently and kindly to approach uh, these people who need help in this matter. Gentle persuasion is certainly necessary. Loud talk is a threat, and many of these people feel threatened. They are taught to accept persecution. Incidentally, this is particularly true of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They are taught to expect persecution. Therefore, if you abuse them in any way, if you are, cr are severely critical of them, you're just, you're adding to their pleasure. You're helping them. So this is not the way to get to their, through to their minds. We must avoid anything that even comes close to persecution for they expect that. And because that's an integral to their faith. I would like to suggest that we urge a sincere person, and this, since this is coming into our colleges and universities across the country, here's where we can begin to do some work because they're taught to go to libraries and to books and to get good uh, guidance on their thinking. I, the, I think a particularly good thing to suggest is the interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible. It's one of the latest things that's come out of this type, and urge them to read the material about, um, about Revelation and Daniel. Daniel in the Old Testament, Revelation in the New Testament. Read the material there with all of its carefully organized approach so that they can see for themselves things that they may never have seen before. And also the article on apocalyptic literature, the background of apocalypticism. How did it all begin in history? It began primarily in the second century BC. And you get a wonderful article there, although I, I criticize the, the author of that article because he left out one of the best sections he could because he's prejudiced about the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> he doesn't believe the Dead Sea Scrolls came from the first centuries BC and AD, and therefore he leaves out all of that wonderful material about apocalypticism that we have from Qumran community. But that doesn't make any difference. His article, up to, with ex that exception, is very good and very helpful. It lays the basic foundation.
Another thing is to get people to use the Oxford Annotated Bible. I'm not trying to advertise books, but, but simply these are, those two books put together make a college education in Bible study. And if people would only begin to use sound resources, we could make great steps forward, I'm sure. Of course, it's a slow process that takes a long time. One of the most important things that we need to do <clears throat> is to help people to see that concerned persons like myself and like any professor of Bible who's teaching Bible in, in colleges <clears throat> are determined to let the Bible speak for itself. Now that ought to appeal and often does appeal. In other words, I'm more literalistic than, than many um, of the so-called literalists because I demand first letting the Bible say what it wants to say and not conditioning it in any way. Simply take it at face value. Let it speak. And it's amazing what you'll learn if you are careful to do this with a completely open mind. Because you'll discover that the Bible presents a variety of points of view about various things. I'd like to take illustrations here, but I must hasten on. So I'm going to... Um, not to illustrate this, but rather to get to the next point, which I think is better to illustrate. It's, it's more, <clears throat> it's the kind of thing that hits more fully and uh, more to our purpose. In other words, what, the second point that I would make, not only that we need to observe the variety of biblical ideas in the Bible, but we also need to notice that we should stress the forest rather than the trees. Now, that seems like an, um, a contradiction of my first point. One, of course, is to see the, the trees and see the variety of fr trees in the Bible, or, tr or tree ideas, I might uh, say. But on the other hand, we also need to see the total forest to see what is the purpose of the biblical material. And it's interesting to note that when we get that perspective and then use an honest perspective of the variety of, among the forest, put the two together, we come out with an amazing insight that will help solve our problem. Well, let me give an illustration here. Let's take Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11 is the prologue to the Old Testament. If you studied Genesis 1 to 11 very carefully, you will see that the author or authors, and I don't I recognize there are critical problems here, but I'm not, I don't think you need to deal with that in this issue. The purpose of, the, of Genesis 1 to 11 is to set the stage for the basic problem of the Bible, and that is the human condition. Why is the human being in such a mess? Why is the human being in such a condition that he is at sorts points with his fellow man, that he, is, that he suffers, that he goes through all sorts of agony and anguish and so forth. Why? That's what is the basic theme, you might say, to which the biblical authors approach the, their whole purpose. It's the prologue. They start with an assumption that, that needs to be understood. They assume that God is perfect and therefore he would only create a perfect world, a perfect universe. And yet he knows it isn't perfect. And he's asking the question, why? And so therefore he has a prologue to explain how this perfect world, the perfect human being, perfect this, perfect that, was created and yet it is not perfect now. So that's his prologue. Well, let him set his own state. Today, anthropologists, of course, poo-poo a lot of these things. <clears throat> and they come at it from a different standpoint. But that is not the purpose of our studies. We should let this writer set his own stage because the purpose is to get at what follows, not what is involved in those chapters. Therefore, let's not argue with it. Let's simply take his introduction, see how he sets his stage, and now he's ready for his major task. And that is the problem of how to get the human being out of the mess in which he finds himself. In other words, the problem that he's dealing with is the problem of redemption. How to change this human being, how to change the condition in which man finds himself. So if we treat the Bible as a whole, we can see that the prologue is preparing for the major thrust of all the biblical message, and that is how to get the human being out of a condition 
of estrangement from his creator out of the depth of despair and all the other problems of human life and get him back on the track for becoming what he was created to be. And that's what the Bible is all about. Now then, here's where the matter of the future of the world comes in because it's a part of this prologue. But most people seem to overlook a very important part of the prologue in this respect. And maybe I've put the cart before the horse here, but I wanted to prepare for this point, which I think we can see a little clearer if we look at it having talked about the whole purpose first. In chapter 8 of Genesis, we have the story about the results of the flood. You see, God solved the problem of getting rid of evil by just wiping out all human beings except good ones. And it happened to be only one family that was left, the family of Noah. Now, this is a typical Semitic idea. We have the same idea out of the Akkadians and the Sumerians before them. Now, <clears throat> we have in chapter 8 the results of the flood. One family left. So God's going to start all over again now. And we know that he has to get, go through the cycle again to get back to the basic problem. And so we have, therefore, chapter 8 that ends with these words, verses 20 to 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Well, now what could be clearer than that? In other words, this is the great stepping stone for the preparation of the purpose of the Bible. It is, God is saying, well, I've tried once now to get rid of the problem of man's condition simply by wiping out all evil and starting over again. But that didn't work. I'm not satisfied. So now I'm never again going to do that. Now, if you take these words literally, as I do, I feel it's a very important passage to take literally. God has made now a commitment that never again will he do this kind of thing by wiping out evil and leaving only those who are good. Now, we ought to take these words seriously because this is right at the preface of the Bible. It's the prologue to the Bible. And most people just, just sort of blithely go by this and don't notice it, especially because of what happens in chapter 9. Now, technically, of course, we know that there were two different writers involved here. <clears throat> the 8th chapter is from the 10th century B.C. writer, and the 9th chapter comes from the 6th century or 5th century B.C. writer. And it's the 9th chapter or the 6th century B.C. or 5th century B.C. writer who tends to, uh, to cover up the matter in such a way that it gives a loophole for those who want to believe that God is going to do something horrible again and in by 1984, some think, or shortly thereafter. Now, if you look in chapter 9, uh, it speaks about <clears throat> the fact that God will never again do this kind of thing. He says, Behold, I establish, verse 9, and my covenant with you and your descendants forever, and you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, the beasts, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Now you see, this is similar, it's parallel to what we have in chapter 8, but he says that never shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And that leaves the opening. That leaves the, the clue to the way to get around it. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And so the people simply have to say, well, no, it's not going to be by water. Next time it's going to be by fire. And thus the whole thing is lost. But if you go back to chapter 8, verses 20 to 22, you can't say that. Because here it's a general statement of commitment that God makes to all mankind. And I think we ought to watch for that one. Because... This is the basis of the, of the prologue to the Bible message. Then what is God going to do is the thing that is answered in chapter 12 and all the rest of the Bible. Let me point this out to you this way, and I hope this will make it a little more graphic. I'm going to go clear back in the New Testament uh, to the letter of Jude, which is the one, I mean, the letter of 3 John, which is just before the letter of Jude, and then Revelation. 
Now then, let's look at this this way. Here we have the prologue, Genesis 1 to 11, which is stating the purpose of the biblical message, which is that God is never again using this, going to use this method of wiping out evil, but he's going to use another method. All right, here we have third chapter of John, and Jude in Revelation is the epilogue of the Bible, as it is for many people and perhaps most people. Now, all that's in between, all of this, represents the basic message of the Bible, which is what God is going to do rather than what he has done, but what he's going to do. He's going to work in every way possible to redeem human beings rather than to punish or destroy. Now, that is the foundation we need for approaching the matter of apocalyptic literature. For the purpose of the Bible is in this basic material with only these few things on either side which cause the, the confusion. Now, if we understand this, I'm talking about the forest. If we see the forest in this way and realize what the Bible is all about, then we're in a much stronger position to be able to look at apocalyptic literature. Now, it's true that within all of this material there are elements that can be used in, in an apocalyptic way. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm over general, I don't want to generalize too much. But let's look at the larger dimension first before uh, we get uh, confused. In other words, <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make is that the biblical message itself is written uh, with the determination of helping the human being out of his condition of estrangement and bringing him into a relationship with his creator that he may be what he was created to be. So this is the second point of approach that I'd like to suggest. A third point I'd like to suggest is that we now get down to some specifics where the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, are a tremendous help, but I'd rather reserve that for my fourth point. Um, uh, yes, for the fourth point. Um, very quickly, let me just mention these little steps. Go to Mark chapter 9, verse 1, and read Mark 9, 1, very carefully, and ask yourself, what is this saying? This is Jesus speaking, and he, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, if you take those words carefully, what Jesus is saying is that I believe that the consummation of the age, the end of the age, the new kingdom, the new age, is about to dawn within the lifetime of those of you who are standing here before me. Now, put yourself in the first century A.D., approximately 27, 28 A.D., and read those words and then say, now, what did Jesus mean? He meant that the kingdom, that he, that he was talking about, and he was talking in apocalyptic terms. He was using the language of apocalypticism, <clears throat> and uh, he was saying that it's going to be fulfilled within the lifetime of those standing here. Was Jesus right, or was he wrong? Is a valid question. I remember how I used to ask myself that question uh, when I read that passage when I was in, uh, before I went to college, I remember being worried about that, and no one seemed to be able to help me answer the question, but I finally had to answer it for myself. But now let's look at Matt Mark chapter 13, verse 30, where again we have a statement from Jesus that says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place, and you have a full description almost in chapter 13 of the final end of the age. It will, they'll all take place within the generation of those then living. But I take this seriously. You see, this is why we must let the Bible speak its own message. And then I would suggest that you compare, and I'm, I don't want to take time to go into every detail, but compare 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 31, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Now here we have from the writings of Paul, from his own lips, and Paul, of course, of course, dictated this to an amanuensis, so he didn't actually write it himself. His scribe wrote it for him, but that's a minor point. But Paul here is telling us, and this we can confirm without any question of doubt. We don't have to get into literary criticism or anything about this. Here we have Paul using the same language and the same implication, that these things 
are going to happen within the generation of those people then living. Now, why shouldn't we take these passages just as seriously as some others in the Bible when we talk about this kind of a problem? Now, another very good step to take is to use 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to, four, and 1 to 4 to show how the early Christian church handled this problem itself by the end of the century. And then if you add chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 as an explanation, you can see that the early church already was struggling with this problem because the time had gone on, the generation that, during which they expected this to happen had not seen this happen in the way they expected it. And thus we find the early church beginning to revise their ideas about this. It's a part of the picture. And then if we will go uh, to John's gospel, we'll find a very important answer. If we allow John's gospel to speak to us, and we come to chapter 14 of John's gospel, and there we will see that John's gospel is presenting a whole new concept of what God is doing in history. And that the parousia, the second coming of Christ, the, the return, the kingdom, all of these things now are seen in this man's thinking, this author's thinking, as being fulfilled throughout the centuries by the, at the time when someone accepts the redemption that is offered by the biblical message. And therefore, when the Holy Spirit comes within the life of a person and turns him around and begins to fulfill his life as he was intended to be fulfilled as a created being, that that is the parousia, that is the coming, and that is the new age that dawns on each individual life. And it can go on therefore forever. In other words, it's an eternal coming. It's an eternal apocalypticism, we might use it, although that's not a good term now, because that's a literary term. But it's an eternal eschatology. In other words, the eschaton is always available to everyone, anytime, depending upon him. Now that is the purpose of John's Gospel. And one thing to do, incidentally, in this, is to read John's Gospel very carefully, looking for evidences of apocalyptic expressions. That is, expressions of the coming end of the age. Then read Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and compare those with John, and you'll see that they approach the whole matter entirely differently. Now, which are you going to accept? And that becomes a question for each person to decide. Therefore, the approach that we can make is in a gentle way to people who are concerned of this kind of thing is to guide them through some of the passages that they normally avoid and help them to come to see that maybe the Bible has some other things to say than what they're accustomed to thinking it's saying. But now then the Dead Sea Scrolls is the most important approach than the contribution that's come just within the li our lifetime of most of us. Um, the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scroll is one of the most important contributions at this point because we see in the Dead Sea Scroll a community that was established for the purpose of preparing for this final day, and they expected it every day they expected it to come. And they lived within that context of daily expectation out in the wilderness, preparing the way for God's coming with this new age. They did so for almost 200 years until finally the community was destroyed in AD 68 by the sons of darkness whom they expected to destroy by means of the help of the, he of the heavenly hosts. Now, those people spent almost 200 years testing out the validity of the apocalyptic hope, and it was found wanting. They disappeared from the face of history until they were accidentally rediscovered by a, <clears throat> a shepherd throwing a rock in the cave by the Dead Sea. If 2,000 years is not sufficient time to test an important point of this kind, well, then I don't know what is. That then leads, of course, to the, <clears throat> the conclusion, and that is that where does this apocalyptic literature that is so commonly used in such books as this, where does it belong in history? How should we use it? How should we handle it? The evidence is perfectly clear that it is not central to the biblical message. 
It is peripheral. In fact, I like to call it the ancient Bible writer cop-out. But I, I hesitate to do that because that is super critical. I would rather say that it is the result of people who have met complete frustration. It's an answer to the frustration of humans who face ultimate decision of whether they will live in their faith or die with their faith, or they will live and deny their faith or die in their faith. Now that's the problem. And I often ask this question, I'd ask it of you. Has any one of you ever had to face that decision as to whether you will maintain your faith and therefore lose your life, or whether you will reject your faith and continue to live. Has any of you ever had to make a decision of that kind? Nobody in our world has had to do that. Not even in the serious situation in the time of Hitler was such a question as that. There it was just a general persecution. But um, I mean, that's what the Christians had to face. That's what the Jews had to face in the ancient world. And that is the source of apocalyptic literature. It's people who face that kind of dilemma, that kind of terrible tragedy in their lives where their totalitarian rulers were of such a nature that they <clears throat> threatened death to people who would not renounce their religious faith. Now, when you come to that kind of a decision, then you can understand the purpose of apocalyptic literature. It was to help people in just such a crisis in their lives. Well, there are many other things that I'd like to uh, include here, but I must conclude for, as usual, time is always my enemy. I think I'm reading my watch right, yes. Let me just conclude this way, that one of the most important things I think is needed in our society today is more expository preaching from the Bible by the ministers in our pulpits. I think we need this. There's not enough expository preaching. People are hungry for an understanding of the Bible, and I think the pulpit is a very important place where it should be done. Instead of just taking a little passage of Scripture and a springboard for dealing with modern problems, we ought to just work with biblical text as sermons. I think there'll be a, well, I think it'll increase the attendance at churches, for one thing, if this were happening. Another thing I would like very much to emphasize is that this expository preaching should deal more with the central themes of the Bible in the larger dimension of the purpose of the Bible and help people to come to grips with this. But then also, I would leave with you my favorite theme song of my teaching for the last 34 years. I've used it every year in almost every class. My theme song is that which is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, where we find Paul saying to the people of Ephesus, speaking the truth with love we are to grow up. One of the problems in the Christian church and in Judaism has been the large number of persons who have, are very devout, very sincere, but they haven't grasped the significance of what Paul means about growing up in their faith. Well, I'm going to have to stop, and I haven't been able to go into all the ramifications of what we can do to help but I hope that we will do something because I think 1984 does not need to be a worry or a fear or concern in the minds of people, but rather it's a great opportunity for beginning a new whole approach to human life. And I see it as an opportunity to use in this respect as a new beginning. If we wish to use it as such a date, I think it ought to be every day a new beginning. But at the same time, I think that this does not need to be used in fear, but to use, be used in hope by an understanding of the nature of apocalyptic literature and from the ancient time and gradually coming to see that it is only incidental to the biblical message, which will always go on for centuries and centuries to come because God is always seeking to redeem his creation of man. Well, any questions or, or do we have time for questions or uh, is our time up? Have I spoken too long? I don't want to... Uh, uh, well, I think there are any questions. Yeah, how do you, uh, how does the consumer get to your nineteen eighty four? What is their technique? Well, they just get the technique. Thanks for asking that question because I can go back to those notes that I skipped here. <laughs> um, the point is this. They take the book of Daniel first. 
And in chapters 7 and 8, they have references which are somewhat cryptic in nature, somewhat vague, and they take these to, ref uh, and they, <clears throat> they interpret them to follow history beginning with the Assyrian period, and then the Babylonian period, and then the Persian period, and then they jump over to the Roman period. Now, the only way they can get those dates is by jumping over the period of the Diadochi. I don't know whether that's a familiar term to you or not, but the Diadochi are the secret to a sound understanding of Daniel. When you include the period of the Diadochi, which is the period from 301 BC down to 165 BC in Hebrew history, when you include that period, which is natural you should if you're going to follow the course of the words that are behind the cryptic expressions, then you come down to 168 BC for the time when the book is being written and about which it's talking. But in order to, to get up into the modern age, they have to avoid those years. So 301 to 168 BC are carefully skipped over and they take, it, uh, they take those cryptic expressions to refer to the Romans. Now the reason they do this is because this is what the writer of the book of Revelation did. Already that principle was discovered that if you just ignored the period of the Hellenistic uh, Empire uh, of the middle, uh, control of the Middle East and jump over to the Roman, that then uh, you can bring it up to their time. And then they take the book of Revelation and uh, interpret it by changing uh, years into centuries or I mean, a days into years and so forth, they take the book of Revelation, and I'm oversimplifying, I know, and that brings them up to 1914. They get the year 1914 as a key date. And then when 1914 came, and of course they were expecting it all to happen in 1914. In fact, the beginning of the First World War confirmed it in the minds of many. Uh, the Russellites, for instance, they were convinced that this was the beginning, but it didn't work out that way. 1914 didn't develop the way they expected. And so they went back to the Bible and they discovered about how there was a 70 year period mentioned in the book of, of Jeremiah. And so they added 70 to 1914 and came up with 1984. You see? So that's where they get 1984. It is simply taking the words and playing with them until you get the date that you want. And this is what they've been doing right along. It's just playing with words until you find a way to get, out, get the date, whatever date you want it, to make it. And so 1984 is the date that they're using. And then, of course, they've made, they make a mistake, however, in interpretation of one part of Hebrew history. So they're always 20 years off. So when they discover that, then they're going to jump to 2004, you see. Now, when they get to 2004, I don't know what they'll do after that. <laughs> but I'm sure they'll find a way. <laughs> I'm sure they'll find a way. Because if you start with that basic assumption that the Bible is the literally verbal inspired word of God, you see, they always, that always means then you can take the words and you can move them around and play with them and then get the idea across that God's revealing what you're discovering to you. And just as they did, the Qumran community of the Dead Sea Scrolls did, here was a person who believed that he knew all the secrets, the very words are used on one of the manuscripts, uh, the Habakkuk commentary, column seven. I'm going to show that tonight, in column seven, where it says that he, uh, to whom God has made known, this teacher, to whom God has made known all the mysteries of his wor the words of his servants, the prophets. In other words, they believed that God had specially revealed the proper interpretation of scripture, and he came out with a conclusion that scripture was, in, was speaking about the period in which they were living, which was the, the latter part of the second century BC and the first century BC. And all of that has been carefully worked out in those documents that we now have. The same thing that's being done today was done 2,000 years ago. And I think that, that helps us because by noticing this, well, then we have a chance for a 2,000 year reflection <laughs> on the interim. <laughs> Some other question. <clears throat> Talked about the uh, eschaton always being available in the sense of uh, the fulfillment of the age or the conclusion of the age. Personally, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. during the personal conversion. Uh, what kind of response would you make to uh, some person that made uh, an affirmation of the literal second coming of Christ, or the second coming? Would you, would you interpret it in these terms? 
Well, you see, the point is, when he does that, he's using Pauline literature, particularly Thessalonians, and he's using uh, Mark 13, um, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. That's what he's basing it on, you see, that whole concept. But if you can get him to take a look at John's gospel and the way John handles it and let John speak to him, then you can see that John, he doesn't use the word parousia, it's true, but at the same time he does lay the foundation and is obviously trying to offer a substitution for the delay of the parousia. And so it's a matter of patient working with him to see whether he can see that John is offering another solution to the problem. But why would John be preferred uh, over against the other, over against the synoptics, when, uh, for instance, with, as to do with the uh, Jesus' self-understanding of Messiahship, yeah. I think most of us, or I would, mm -hmm. vote on behalf of the synoptics. But the interesting part of it is that for most other matters of of Christian theology, they do go to the Gospel of John. So that's the reason I say, well, here's a chance to tie in what they already are doing with another use of the Gospel of John that they haven't used. Because you see what they do, they always avoid this. What they say is that what John's verse four, uh, chapter 14 of John is talking about is the, um, uh, is the um, uh, Pentecost experience. You see, he's, uh, they take that to refer only to Pentecost. And therefore, it's not referring to the parousia, but it's referring to the Pentecost. But we have to work very carefully then to try to help them to see that there is this other option. I'm not saying whether you can succeed in it or not. It's up to them to come to grips with it themselves and discover that the option. Because, uh, well, uh, what I would like to have done and I didn't get a chance to do is when you take the revelation of John, and one thing I, I should have emphasized there that, um, uh, that you need to do with this, is to take the beginning of the uh, revelation of John. Uh, take revelation, um, one, uh, one to three, and, and take it literally. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants, what must, <clears throat> it says, entake, what must immediately, you could translate that in Greek, from the Greek, what must soon take place, must, must immediately take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written therein. And now notice what it says. For kairos angus, it says in Greek. For the time is near. Now what does angus and entakai, atake in Greek mean? We find in all of Greek writings, whenever a writer wanted to emphasize the immediacy of something, that it's going to happen within the next few weeks or months. That's when he uses entake or anguis. Now, we find, and you go through the whole Revelation of John, and you find it appears 10 times in Revelation. Now, let's take it literally. What is there for the author doing? Let's put ourselves back in the time when he wrote, approximately AD 95. And listen to this, for instance, in chapter, the very last of Revelation 22, 6. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must entake take place. What must very soon, or I would like to translate it immediately. It almost has the strength of immediately take place. And behold, I am coming anguish soon. You see. Now, again, down in verse uh, 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Kairos Engus appears again. And he says, do not seal up these words, because it's so near that there isn't time to seal them up, you see. And then verse 12, behold, I am coming soon. In other words, if you just take it literally, now you can see that the author is saying that it's going to happen within a very short time. Incidentally, in that passage there about uh, don't seal up, do not seal up, in the book of Daniel it says do seal up because the writer is writing as though he's in the time of the exile, six, in the time of the Babylonians. And therefore he says do, do, uh, do seal up this because the time is far hence and the time is 165 BC. 
you see. And therefore, he says, do seal it up. Well, here it says, do not seal it up. Now, when we put those in juxtaposition with each other, we have a base, therefore, for seeing what the real purpose of the writing is. And I think this, that, that can help us if we just let it speak its natural self to us. Then we have to put ourselves in their day and realize that the writers were concerned about what was going to happen very, very soon. And this, of course, was to give courage to those who were being persecuted. And thus, the material becomes, uh, you might say, the epilogue of the Bible rather than the basic message of the Bible. It is simply material that was put in for the purpose of crisis periods in human life. And now if we start with it then in the sense of eschaton, that where we face crises, then we approach eschatology completely differently. We think of it in a crisis context. And thus the Bible always becomes a source of help in times of crisis. We can use it that way. We have to make a different approach to eschatology, in other words. And I think we should be doing it. I think it's a very important task. I don't know whether you're experiencing this kind of a problem here on, on this campus or not, but boys, I know some colleges are really in, are full of it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Krieger, and I want to mention again tonight at 7.30, we'll be speaking at St. Bernard Methodist Church. Actually, I forgot to mention this little book, although I'm not too excited about it, but uh, it's called The Future of the Great Planet Earth. <laughs> have any, I don't know if any of you have seen it or not, but this is a little book that was put out to answer this. And it's called The Future of the Great Planet Earth by Richard Hansen. Now, um, some of it I'm a bit disappointed about, but chapter six I think is very well done. It's the key passage. It's the key part to help answer this. So it's another little resource that could be used to help answer the problem if we need to. Thanks, Thanks a lot.